right. Let's do chapter two. All right, so you should, um, however you want to do it, if you guys want to do your notes first and then listen to me um, and add to your notes, or if you want to listen to me while simultaneously doing your notes and pausing it, that's fine. Um, I will be instructing you to um, view some videos. Sorry, let me get this right. Don't fall. Okay. I, I will be um, instructing you guys to view some videos. Of course, you can't click those links while you're watching this video, but you can click the links when you're actually on the notes. Okay. Um, it's going to be one of the easier chapters that we do. So this is Marine Ecosystems and Biodiversity. It's chapter two in the textbook. Um, we'll be ordering many more textbooks. They're already getting a purchase order ready, ready for them. So there we go. All right. This is for you to read. This is straight from the Cambridge syllabus, what your outcome should be from after this chapter. Okay. Vocab words. Um, due on Thursday, the 30th, and you're going to have a vocab quiz. I don't want that there. We're going to have a vocab quiz on that Friday. And then I believe a week after that is your first test. I don't have a syllabus in front of me. so. Um, all right. So the words are estuary, ecosystem, biotic, abiotic, habitat, species, population, community, biodiversity, ecological niche. People say niche. It's not wrong, but I say niche. Mutualism, parasitism, competition, predation, photo autotrophs, chemo autotrophs, producers, consumers, food chain, food web, trophic level, predator, prey, keystone species, shoaling, succession, specialized ecological niche, generalized ecological niche. Okay, <clears throat> just a little bio review. So the way we name species is by their genus and then their species name. Um, the genus is always going to be capitalized and it's in italics. The species name is lowercase and in italics. At the bottom, they, these are two different species of butterfly fish. And you can see how they've written their name all the way at the bottom there. Okay, we're homo sapiens, my favorite animals, Orchinus orca. Carcharodon carcaris is the great white shark. Megaptera novanglidae is our humpback whale, the big winged New Englander. Okay, um, again, bio definitions. Habitat is the place an organism that lives. Ecological niche is one of those we have to be 150% on um, and be perfect with it. It is the role an organism plays in an ecosystem. The role has to be the role. Okay. Species, it's a group of similar organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Sometimes species is a two mark question because they want you to get that and produce fertile offspring. So, you know, we can have um, the tiger and the lion interbreed. They are similar species. They can interbreed and they produce a liger, but um, that liger is sterile. So that baby liger, it's, it's not fertile. It can't have more of its own. A liger can't mate with another liger, make more ligers, that can't happen. So they are not species, they are <clears throat> hybrids. Let's call them a mutant, they're hybrids. Um, a population is a group of the same species. So one species and then a population is a group of the same species. So human population, we're all the same. Um, community, now we're adding in different populations together. So now you're not the same. So a community for us would be like students in the classroom plus the plants I have in the back. So that's, you know, they're living, um, but they are not our species. Um, we could also include the bacteria that are all over the place. They are living, but they're not our species. That's a community. Um, communities, when they talk about community, is all of the biotic, all of the living components in an ecosystem is what the community is. All, everything that's living. Population is a group of the same. Community is going to be multiple groups of populations. Ecosystem. So ecosystem now, it includes your biotic components, the living components, and the abiotic components. So um, living organisms and the chemical and physical factors that influence them. So we have the living portion, 
wonder, just trying something out. Let's see. Ooh, laser pointer. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Living portions and the physical and chemical factors that influence them. So this is living and non-living. So, okay. What's the weather like? Um, you know, is it raining right now? Um, is it cold? Is there, is it rocky? What's the soil like? Um, is it made of clay? Is it made of sand? Is it cloudy? So it would um, not be, obviously, I'm not checking to make you see if you come up with your own examples. Um, this would be a good thing for you to maybe do with your vocab right now. Um, but it's not a bad idea for you to try this out. So my favorite thing, my favorite is an orca. So their habitat is going to be like in the Arctic. Um, their niche, they're an apex predator. The species would be one orca, orchinus orca. Population would be a pod of orcas. The community would be orcas living with um, seals and penguins and seabirds. That works. Um, and then their ecosystem would be in the Arctic Ocean. The temperature is very cold. It has a lot of oxygen content dissolved in the water because it is cold. Uh, it has high salinity. So those would be that's just a quick example of that. Okay, and so what's going to affect our ecosystem is the biotic factors, the, the living components, you know, what you can eat, who you can mate with, do you have competition with something, and then the abiotic factors, your non-living components. Come on. There we go. Biotic um, means living. So right here in the middle, um, we have the Greek words, bio is living, Tick means to be pertaining to. Um, so biotic is pertaining to life, and a biotic is not pertaining to life. Biotic or living components. Sometimes it's hard for students to think about that, but um, it's going to be predation. So that is a living component, a, um, a predator hunting a prey. Um, symbiosis is a living component. Having a relationship, whether it's mutualistic, parasitistic, or commensalistic, doesn't matter. Having that interpopulation or interspecies relationship. Um, availability of mates is a living biotic component. Availability of food is a living biotic component. Um, we can't say availability of habitats because depending on where you live, it might not be a living component. I don't know if I said competition, but competition is one as well. Okay, abiotic is non-living. So again, what's the temperature like? What's the soil condition? Um, what's the water temperature? The weather all the time. That's that's your living non-living component, the abiotic. Okay, let me pause. Ooh. One second. Okay, we're back. Um, so a marine ecosystem example would be like a rocky shore. So it's going to be the organisms that are living there and um, they're linked together with their flow of energy, kind of like a trophic level transfer, who eats who, who's dependent on who, um, and their environment. So a lot of abiotic factors here are um, you have the tide change. So you have some organisms that are exposed once the tide goes out. Um, you have a very rocky substrate or um, surface. Get used to that word substrate. Substrate is the surface in which you grow on. So a sandy substrate, a rocky substrate, a marsh or mud substrate. Um, the waves get quite big there. Okay, um, uh, weathering is high. There's a lot of weathering. And so that's just some of the, the abiotic components for that ecosystem. And the organisms there really have to be adapted to the changing tides, so they don't want to dry out. And the fancy word, the Cambridge term for dry out is called desiccate or desiccation. Desiccate. This video is funny. It's just a good example of some marine environments. Okay, habitat example would be a hydrothermal vent. Hydrothermal superheated water, so the bottom of the ocean, provides a habitat for species of tube worms. The species of tube worm is called um, Riftia, Riftia, R-I-F-T-I-A, Riftia. They live in hydrothermal vents. 
a population. So a group of ghost crabs live on sandy shores. Okay, and again, I just want to real quick point out, if we were trying to do population sampling with these ghost crabs, they move. So maybe mark and recapture might be something you want to look at. However, this guy is really good at camouflage, obviously. A lot of times the only time we see crabs at the beach is when we see them move. Um, but imagine you put a dark color on this crab, something that you know will be evident to you, that's gonna cause that crab to be more susceptible to predation. Um, it could harm it, it could wash off, and then you don't know who's in your original population. Um, and, and you're gonna have a bias. The next time you go out there, if you see a crab with a mark on it, you're gonna take it. Um, somebody else could take it too. So a mollusk community on a rocky shore. It's all different species of mollusks living here. Some small ones that you don't see. They usually like grow on top of each other. Species example, a skipjack tuna or red mangrove trees. An ecological niche example. So this is the organism's role. So a great white shark, its role is to be an apex predator, the top predator in its ecosystem. Don't forget in biology, we talked about the competitive exclusion example. Or, I'm sorry. Competitive exclusion principle, that example, principle. So that means that no two species, so two of the same, can live in the same habitat, doing the same role or the same niche at the same time, or else they will have competition. So one will have to leave or one will have to die. And that's the competitive exclusion principle. No two species can live in the same habitat, doing the same thing, the same role, the same niche at the same time, or somebody's going to have to leave and someone's going to have to die, or someone has to die. Okay, so um, the shark has its niche, and if something else came to take its niche, the shark would obviously try and kill it or get it out of there. So organisms will occupy similar niches. They will tend to compete with each other. They're going to compete for mates. They're going to compete for space. They're going to compete for food resources. Um, if it's a land animal, they're going to compete for water resources. Okay, the term biodiversity. So, um, again, bio is life. So, this is going to be the amount of different species present in the ecosystem. Okay, and, and they do take into account the different ecosystems that are in that area. But this is a, a, the amount of different species in that area. Okay, so places that are very diverse are going to be rainforests. But if we're going to make it a marine example, um, coral reefs, right? They have really high biodiversity. So many different species live there. We use coral reefs heavily whenever we're looking at um, new medicines, especially within the producers. Um, they are, they are in, you know, the rainforest of the ocean, essentially. Very high biodiversity. Um, a sandy shore low biodiversity. There are not many organisms that can live within the sand, that many at all, because they have to be able to adapt to being underwater occasionally um, and then exposed and out against the elements, against the sun, against the cold, against rain, against predators. They have to find a way to burrow or find a way to hide. So that, you know, we don't really see many species or many organisms that are living in sandy shores. Okay, a quadrat. Again, this is what we use to um, find a population estimate when we're using random sampling. So I, I noticed this a couple times um, when I was looking at the common cockle assignment. So um, a couple of people are writing, I'm going to use the quadrat method. So it's really called the random sampling method. And you're taking a random sample by using a quadrat. It can be anywhere from one meter square large or um, a quarter of a meter square small. Okay, and this is going to be for organisms that typically don't move. And there's too many to count. And we have a large area. So we're going to take sample areas. Symbiosis. You guys have had symbiosis for a while. So the relationship between two different organisms. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me pause this really quick. I don't know if it's pausing. Come on. Okay. Um, big mistake here.
So symbiosis, this is not going to be your definition. Um, this is the definition for mutualism. Sorry, this is mutualism. It's a cursive S. Okay, because it says both are deriving a benefit. The relationship between two different organisms where both derive a benefit. This is mutualism. Um, symbiosis, I'll just read it out of the, the text. Symbiosis literally means living together. The term refers to the interspecies relationship between two or more organisms from different species living in close physical association. Okay. So symbiosis is just having a relationship with something. Whether it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. That's what symbiosis is. So, uh, I'm really annoyed at that. Mm, this should be mutualism. Okay, um, so your definition for mutualism, both, it, so the relationship is mutual. There's a, both a beneficial factor. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, examples are gonna be corals and zooxanthellae. You have to know this one. You have to know this. Cleaner fish and a grouper, or cleaner fish and any fish. That cleaner fish, um, it's actually called a uh, wrasse fish. W R A S S, wrasse fish. Okay, chemosynthetic bacteria and tube worms. Write down all of these examples, write them down. Write them down, all of the examples. You should be writing it down. Don't choose one, you need to know them all. Okay, so the corals and the zooxanthellae. You can say zooxanthellae, you can say zooxanthellae, and as you see towards the bottom, I kind of got annoyed at typing it out, so I started to shorten it. Okay, so corals and zooxanthellae are a very popular question that Cambridge likes to ask about symbiosis. Mm -hmm. Um, so zooxanthellae is a symbiotic algae that lives within stony corals. A symbiotic algae that lives within stony corals. So it's doing a job. It has a relationship with the corals. Okay, it's a dinoflagellate. Dinoflagellate. Dino means whirling. And then flagella, uh, or flagellate is from the word flagellum, which means whip. And zooxanthellae have, or, I'm sorry, dinoflagellates have that flagellum that whirls, that goes in a circle. Um, so how do they relate to each other? Corals um, provide a safe and nutrient-rich environment for the algae. Okay, so I'll, I'll, there's a couple on the side, and then I'll read a couple more that are a little bit more in-depth. Corals cannot create their own energy, so they use carbohydrates created through photosynthesis. It's the zooxanthellae. They are the algae. They are green. It's the zooxanthellae that is doing photosynthesis inside of the coral, inside of it. And the coral is going to be able to, you know, take some of that carbohydrates that are made and use it for itself. Corals are alive. However, they cannot make their own energy and they cannot get enough energy, take in enough to keep them alive. So they have to have the, the zooxanthellae component to help them. Okay, um, great. How do the zooxanthellae benefit? They help create carbon for the calcium carbonate that the corals are made of. All right, and I'll read a little bit more. Um, so as the coral grows, it respires aer um, aerobically. And it will also, that will also provide the zooxanthellae for carbon dioxide that it needs to do for photosynthesis. All living things are going to respire. The zooxanthellae is also going to respire. The corals also respire. Okay. Um, the carbon from the zooxanthellae gets incorporated here in this calcium carbonate shell. All shells are made of calcium carbonate. Um, the last one, the zooxanthellae provide a safe habitat um, with a big surface area so they can absorb light. They're provided with that from the coral. 
Um, the zooxanthellae also obtain other minerals from the coral's waste products. For example, um, nitrogen compounds so that they can make proteins and they can make ATP and they can make DNA. They also can use phosphates from the coral's waste products um, to create deoxyribonucleic acid to make DNA. Um, to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Also, the phosphates help on cell membranes as well, that phospholipid membrane. So they both help each other in multiple ways. Um, replay this back, listen to it again, pause it, write down what I have on the screen, write down what I just said, um, watch a video if necessary, whatever you need. Here's what they look like. So corals actually, uh, you know, they're a natural like carbonate shell color. They're gonna be like white. And when we see color, you're actually seeing the zooxanthellae that live inside of it. So if we look at a coral anatomy, and you don't need to know the coral anatomy, but it should help you understand. They have this calcium carbonate skeleton. Okay, calcium carbonate is kind of like chalk, but it's, it's harder. Um, this is why they can dissolve whenever it gets acidic. All right. Um, looking at right at the edge of their tentacles. Okay, here's their mouth so they can eat. Um, but here's the edge of their tentacles. And like I said, they don't take in enough energy through eating. If we zoom in, on the outside, we have these little cells. They're called nomadocysts, they're nomadocytes. And what's inside of them is a nematocyst, like a stinging, it's like a, a needle. And that's why some corals can sting you. Um, jellyfish also have nematocytes. Remember, cyto is cell. So these are stinging cells. And what stings you is this tiny little, you know, almost microscopic dagger. It's called a nematocyst, N-E-M-A. Okay, underneath that tissue is where the zooxanthellae live. When corals are young, they like suck in these zooxanthellae and then they assimilate them into their body tissues. And so the zooxanthellae, of course, need to be on the outside of the tentacle so that they can take in all of the sunlight that they can because they're photosynthesizers. And their photosynthesis also helps the coral um, you know, have energy and have, have a carbohydrate source. So, um, Corals and zooxanthellae are completely separate. They're besties, but they are completely separate. If you see a color associated with a coral, you are seeing pigments from the zooxanthellae. They don't just have um, chlorophyll. That's their primary pigment for photosynthesis, but that's not all they have. Here we can see it under um, a microscope. Okay. Um, so corals can adjust the algae in the population by releasing them or taking more in. Um, when maybe it gets more acidic or the salinity changes or it gets too hot or too cold, the corals will eject out the zooxanthellae and be like, you can't live here anymore. And that's why they start to bleach because they lose their pigment. They lose their, their body. Their body. So zooxanthellae is very sensitive, really sensitive. It cannot live in low salinity levels, so you can't have freshwater corals. Um, and that just helps with it doing active transport, passive transport, osmosis. Um, they cannot live below 100 meters or 300 feet. Why? Because then you're out of the photic zone, you're out of the light zone, and they need to photosynthesize. Um, and then they thrive in temperatures above 20 degrees Celsius, which is above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. They thrive above it. So this is like their threshold for their minimum. Warmer is better. The wrasse fish, there you go. And the grouper. So the wrasse fish, you guys have seen this before, especially if I was your teacher. Um, the wrasse fish will go into uh, the mouth of another organism and pick out um, dead, dead skin, parasites, and they help keep the, the mouth clean of these organisms. Fish don't have hands. They don't have a dentist. Um, fish get parasites and dead skin removed. So the wrasse fish is your cleaner fish and that benefits by getting a nutrient source, 
your grouper is going to benefit or any other fish is going to benefit by getting their, their mouth cleaned um, or parasites taken off. Um, if there's, yeah, that's fine. Sometimes there's parasites on the gills. Taking it off there is good. Um, there's a lot of examples of this. Pilot fish cleaning off sharks. Pacific cleaner shrimp and blue streak cleaner wrasse cleaning eels. Okay. Know and understand chemosynthesis and these in this relationship. We're gonna talk about chemosynthesis for a while and it is a primary productivity source for the ocean. So we can't ignore it just because we're like more familiar with photosynthesis. We have to know this. So chemo means chemical and synthesis means to make. This is chemosynthetic bacteria. It is microscopic bacteria that live inside of these tube worms. They live inside of them and they do this process called chemosynthesis. Chemosynthetic bacteria perform chemosynthesis. Um, plants or autotrophs, photoautotrophs, perform photosynthesis. So the mutualistic relationship organisms here are the chemosynthetic bacteria and your tube worm. So a hydrothermal vent, hydro is water, thermal is heat. These are vents powered by like volcanic heat from underneath the earth. The earth is not a, the earth is not flat, number one, but the bottom of the ocean is not perfect. Um, the, the lithosphere there does have some deformities and it does have some areas that are, um, what's the word, vulnerable. So for example, the lithosphere is not perfectly thick the whole way you know, underneath your ocean. You could have some areas that are thin. It's going to be those areas or at plate boundaries, tectonic plate boundaries, that magma is going to push up. You know, The mantle of the earth has so much pressure built into it. Um, it's literally going to push out of any of that crack. Um, just because it's it's a vulnerable area. So that is where we can create these hydrothermal vents. You, they're, sometimes they're called black smokers because they um, release a black plume of gas. You can see it right here. Is this? No, okay. Is it a link? I'm sorry, I'm a poor soul at the moment. This is a link. Okay, so, I mean, you guys can go on the actual website, I believe, or not the actual website, actual PowerPoint, and click this picture. Looks like it is. Anyway, um, you see this really big plume of black smoke. It's big. It's big. This picture doesn't give it justice. But that is tons and tons and tons of super hot water and dissolved minerals from the Earth's crust coming out into the ocean. Within there um, are a ton of different chemicals we'll get to in just a moment. So what is the conditions like in this area? Um, we have water that's being recirculated. It will seep into the tectonic cracks and come back out with the pressure. It gets like super boiled. The emerging water that comes out is rich in minerals and chemicals. It's gonna provide the nutrients for photosynthetic bacteria, or chemosynthetic bacteria. So photosynthesis, um, the energy for that is coming from the sun. Chemosynthesis, the energy from that is coming from chemicals that come out of these hydrothermal vents. And the chemicals are from the crust of the earth. You are near boiling temperatures here. So even though it's super cold down here and the pressure is immense, um, no sunlight shines there. So it's super cold. It does get near boiling because um, of the, all of that energy coming from the mantle of the earth. Tons of pressure, um, there's no light, and they are also called black smokers. These conditions, what it's like there, you need to know them. So let's talk about the, the actual relationship. So tube worms, the tube worm species is called Riftia pachyptilla. We can call it Riftia. You need to know Riftia. So, um, Riftia, they don't have a mouth, they don't have a di digestive tract. So I'll talk about um, on the next slide, I believe, how they get their bacteria inside of them. 
Okay. Um, so inside of the tube worms, just like inside our intestines and inside our stomach, we have um, symbiotic bacteria that live in there, help break down our food. Um, chemosynthetic bacteria live inside the tube worms. They live oops, down here in the white area. The white area is called chitin. It's like um, it's similar to keratin, but chitin is um, like the exoskeleton of arthropods, a cockroach, a beetle. Those are chitin. Okay, so the chemosynthetic bacteria live inside the tube worm. Awesome. Tube worm doesn't have a mouth or a digestive tract, so it can't eat food itself. It's going to rely on this bacteria. Um, they provide energy for the tube worms from hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide that comes from the vents. Know this. So for photosynthesis, your energy component is sunlight. For chemosynthesis, your main energy component is hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide. Smells really bad. Um, this is just supplemental. So about the tube worm. Um, the red organ you see in the tube worm is called the plume. So this right here is the plume. It's red because it has hemoglobin, which is the same protein that we have that takes oxygen around our cells. So it aids in gas exchange so the bacteria can get what they need to do to do chemosynthesis. Um, they need this gas, this hydrogen sulfide gas, transported to them. Hemoglobin will help do that. They also need um, oxygen taken to them and carbon dioxide taken to them. All right. Um, and if we are looking here at the formula, now I think the idea of chemosynthesis is pretty new for scientists and still not 150% on the exact formula because there's multiple ways they can chemosynthesize. So you see um, there's different carbohydrates it can synthesize. Remember, carbohydrates are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a one to two to one ratio. They also release sulfuric acid sulfuric acid. So that makes conditions in the hydrothermal vent really acidic. But um, back to what I was saying, I've seen chemosynthesis formulas with multiple different energy sources, not necessarily always hydrogen sulfide. Um, it's really depending on what's coming out of the hydrothermal vent. Um, so how do our bacteria get inside of the tube worms in the first place? So when you just have a, a baby little tube worm, baby little riftia, riftia. Um, so the giant tube worms reproduce, they release their eggs into the water. After hatching, your young baby larvae tube worms will swim down, attach themselves to some rocks. And then as the larvae start to grow, and so that would be an example of zo um, zooplankton, but as the larvae start to grow, they will make a um, just a temporary mouth and a gut so that they can take in the symbiotic bacteria. If they don't, as adults, they don't have mouths. No mouth here, no mouth. There's no mouth, no digestive tract. No mouth, no digestive tract. So they need a way to get food. In the very beginning of their life, they have this tiny little mouth and so they can suck in this bacteria. As the worm grows older, the mouth and gut go away and the bacteria get trapped inside. So where is it beneficial? Um, the tube worm, the actual long tube worm, Riftia, benefits because um, it is getting a food source, right? It's getting a food source from the chemosynthetic bacteria. The chemosynthetic bacteria benefit because they have a habitat now. These tube worms live on the vents. So the bacteria need a place to live really close to the vents as well. You click this, there's just a little bit more information about the giant tube worms. Parasitism. So like a parasite. This is a relationship between organisms where one is going to benefit at the expense of the other, the host. So the host is getting eaten and the parasite is doing the eating. Parasites are going to get their nutrients from the host. They can, um, you know, transmit uh, multiple diseases. Um, parasites can lay their larvae eggs inside of your tissues and they'll live off your tissue. Two different kinds of parasites. One is ectoparasite, ecto. 
Ecto means on the outside. So they live on the outside of the host. For us, this would be like lice, um, mosquitoes, fleas, ticks. Fish lice is the example. That's an easy one to remember. Or um, sea lice, sea fleas. That's an easy one to remember. We see that a lot. So here they're living on the outside of the scales. Endoparasite. Um, they like endoscopy. Endoscopy is when you swallow a camera and they in, inside. So endo is inside. These are parasites that live inside of the host. They can live in the digestive system. They can attach themselves to gills, like you see in this picture here, these hookworms. Um, they can live in muscle tissue. An example are nematodes, or you can call them roundworms, living in fish. There are multiple questions that say, give an example of, um, or Describe what parasitism means and give an example from the marine environment. So you're pretty much going to give the relationship and you're going to give an example from the marine environment. You can say um, worms, you know, uh, roundworms living in fish, nematodes living in fish, um, fish lice living on the outside of a grouper. Like literally pick one of these easy parasites and then an organism. They need to be marine though. Here is your scanning electron microscope picture of a roundworm in the tissue of a fish. So nematodes are from the Roma nematodea. Nematos means thread. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. And edes is species. So it's like a thread species. But they're also known as roundworms. And they're tiny. Um, they are found everywhere in almost every habitat. They are, I want to say like when the most, they are the most abundant parasite that, um, that the world has. They are in every habitat, um, in almost every organism they can live in. So they can live within plants and animals. Some nematodes have their own nematodes. I love that. Some parasites have other parasites living in them. I just, I think that's just awesome. Nematodes. So um, you don't need to know this, just a little bit extra. Why not know it? Why not know everything? Um, their mouth has a stylet. Looks a little narrow. They have a stylet. It's a hook or like a tube that they will insert into a cell and suck out cellular material. So this is microscopic. It's super small, super, super, super small. But nematodes have nematodes. An, an example could be nematodes and, and um, tuna fish. Trophic levels. Trophic literally means the feeder, so the feeder level in a food chain or a food web. Um, we're always starting with the producers, that's your first trophic level. Then we go to the first consumer, the first eater, the first one that takes something in. It's your second trophic level. Your third trophic level is gonna be a secondary consumer, the second eater. Your fourth trophic level are tertiary consumers, and your fifth trophic level is a quaternary consumer. We don't really go any higher than that, because remember, every step you go up, you only get 10% of the organism below you, 10% of the energy they had. Where does that other 90 go? Well, for example, phytoplankton is going to use a lot of it to do its phytoplankton thing, to reproduce, to photosynthesize, to move, to um, fight off any kind of infection. And then we have some of it that also goes as heat to the um, environment. Trophic levels. Okay. A little bit more definitions. A producer is an organism that synthesizes organic substances. Don't say make, say synthesize. Don't say food, say organic substances or organic material. Stop saying food. They make food. <laughs> They synthesize organic material. They synthesize carbohydrates from simple compounds using light in the sun. And those simple compounds were water and carbon dioxide. A consumer is an organism that has to get energy by feeding on something else, even if it's a plant. Um, within your producers, you have a photoautotroph and a chemoautotroph. Autotroph. Auto, right? That means self. An autobiography is a book written about you by you. So auto is self. Okay, um, and then troph, autotroph. We're going to go back to that trophic level. That means nutrient or feeder. 
You're a self-feeder or self-nutrients. You make your own. Photo autotroph, sun, self-feeder. You feed yourself with the sun. Chemo autotroph, chemo is chemical, auto is self, troph is feeder or nutrient. They make their own food with chemicals. That chemical is hydrogen sulfide, H2S. Um, primary consumers eat plant materials. You can call them an herbivore. Secondary consumers feed on the herbivores. You can call them carnivores. And then your predator is an animal that catches and kills and eats another animal. So a predator is not a parasite. A parasite is just like stealing from you. They're not murdering you. They're, they're eating you. They're just stealing. Predator-prey relationship. Um... So we've also discussed this in all of your biology classes. This is a cyclical relationship. They control each other. Um, this depends on the availability of food, right? Predators and prey. So as your prey population starts to increase, let's say you're, you're small fish, your shark population can start to increase. If your shark population gets too big, they're gonna start to eat too many fish. Well, that sucks. The fish population is going to go down and then the shark population is going to go down and because the shark population continues to go down and there's less predators now the fish population can pop back up and as the fish start increasing over time the sharks will start increasing and then there's too many sharks they eat too many fish and then the fish go down so then the sharks will start to starve and go down they compete sharks go down fish realize that they come back up and there is a lag time in between it's really important for all these predator prey examples or looking at a predator prey graph, you always, always, always need to mention that there's a lag time, right? A lag, if your computer or internet is lagging, it's going slow. And this is because it's not like when sharks start to starve and die, fish are not watching them and saying, oh my gosh, that shark just died. We can have 20,000 more kids. <laughs> And immediately here come out 20,000. It doesn't happen. It takes some time for the environment to realize that there's a loss of predator and your prey, for example, in this, in this one, your fish can start to mate, find a habitat, you know, have their eggs, lay their eggs. Those fish grow, move on to a, you know, large enough size that they're going to be eaten. It takes some time. Likewise, as your fish start reproducing more and they're starting to grow, it's not like the sharks are like, oh my gosh, they just laid 20,000 eggs. Quick, here's 20 more sharks. That doesn't happen. It takes time. We have to be mentioning the lag time. This is a cool video. Watch it. It is, um, this video is um, uh, sea stars feeding on mussels. And a lot of you guys, I'm, it's just going to take too long to actually show it. Please watch it. Um, a lot of you guys have, or people have asked me before, um, how do starfish eat? And it's, they, you know, eject out their stomach into their prey. They, ins there's a tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic video camera inside of the muscle. And you can see in real time, it is sped up. But you can see this happening, their stomach coming into the muscle and then dissolving them. Watch it. Okay. Typical predator prey relationship. There is a lag time. Nothing is happening simultaneously. Okay. Chemosynthesis. Back to my pen. All right. So here's your hydrogen sulfide. They also take in carbon dioxide. They also take in oxygen because they need to do cellular respiration. They also take in water. They can create their sugar. Remember, it's a carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a one to two to one ratio. Glucose is C6H12O6, one to two to one. And then they can also produce, um, this isn't sulfuric acid. No remember. I would say hydrogen sulfate because I know SO4 is sulfate. I don't know, you guys took chemistry last year. So hydrogen sulfide is the primary energy source for hot vents and cold seeps, which are your hydrothermal vents. There they are, black smokers. 
all of your tube worms. There's so many. Okay, and down here is where your chemosynthetic bacteria live. They're doing chemosynthesis inside of the tube worm, Riftia. What is a shoal? A shoal is like a school, but it's not called school. So it's a large number of fish of the same species and approximately the same size. This should make sense. You can have adult grouper shoaling together. There is not going to be juvenile grouper there. The juveniles are going to be living somewhere else. When we talk about A-level and we talk about um, uh, marine reproduction and fish reproduction, they're, you know, it's like their families. The, the different age groups are so split apart from each other. So a shoal is same species and same size. Same species and same size, shoaling together. Could be referred to as a school when they um, group of fish are swimming in a coordinated way, but they shoal. Why? What are the benefits? You guys write all of these down. Many times this question is like an eight point question and it's not hard. So what is the benefit of shoaling? Um, it, there is a hydrodynamic efficiency. So, you know, it, you are more aerodynamic when you're just swimming in a group. They're like following the current of each other. So if you have, you know, 4,000, 5,000 fish all swimming in the same direction, you might not even have to swim too hard. You're just going to follow it because that's the way the current's going. So it's, it has a hydrodynamic efficiency. And if this was a list, the benefits of shoaling, this could be an acceptable result right here, one of them. Now, if it says explain the benefits of shoaling, you need to give this and this and the why. Predator avoidance. Okay, for there's two ways that they can avoid predators by just being confusing. Um, it's difficult for predators to pick out one fish when you have a, a shoal of thousands of fish. Also, they can avoid predators by like, you know, safety and numbers, the buddy system, all of these different eyes looking in all different directions. They're looking out for predators. Fish are amazing. They have on the side of their body, it's called a lateral line and they can sense any sort of movement. You have all experienced this, I'm sure, if you've ever been near water. Um, you know, you're, I'm gonna grab that fish, I'm gonna grab that fish, and you can't even like touch the top of the water and that fish is gone. They all are really great at coordinating something together because of that lateral line. Okay, there's foraging advantages. You, you know, if there's 5,000 of you hunting for food, it's not gonna take too long. The time taken to find food is decreased. Okay, this, this isn't discussing this, but that can also be a disadvantage because it could cause competition. Um, there are reproductive advantages. You know, you don't have to find a mate if there's 5,000 for you to find, it's way easier. You're not searching around for it. So having a group of five, 10,000 fish together, you can find a mate way better than if it was, you know, 20. Okay, so an example of sardines, they form bait balls, can make hundreds and thousands of sardines. Skipjack tuna can form shoals of up to 50,000 individuals. Types of shoalers. Um, this is covered in the text. It really hasn't been covered heavily on any papers. So um, I would focus most on knowing what the benefits are. I'm not saying don't write this, write this because if you don't write it, you know for sure it's gonna be on paper one. That's just the way that's gonna go. But there's two types of shoal shoalers. You could be obligate, like you're obligated. So um, you spend all your time shoaling. And when you're away from your group, uh, they get really agitated. They need to be in the group. Tuna, herring, anchovy, they're like that. Or um, facultative. Facultative? Facultative. I knew it. Oh my God. I'm a poor, I'm a poor one. Facultative. So they show only for a purpose. It's like, so for a function, maybe only for reproduction or only to find food. They're only showing not, not for like their life, just for a certain purpose. Succession. This was the quiz question today. Um, and you'll see the answers at the end of this. So you guys have seen this, a picture like this when, um, in your biology classes. Succession is going to be a gradual process of change that occurs in a community over a period of time. Two point question when you describe what succession is and then you're going to give an example. I guess that would make it three. 
Um, a gradual process of change in a environment or a community. That's one point. Over time is the other point. Primary succession is worst case scenario. In primary succession, um, this would be like a bomb, a volcano, um, retreating glaciers that just scrape down all living material that are on any substrate, you know, whether it's rock or it's sand. And they're exposing new land, new land that has nothing living on it, nothing at all. So primary succession, there is no remnants of the older community that's living there. Nothing at all. There is no producer. There is nothing. The soil is not fertile. You got to start again from square one. Sorry. Secondary succession is a little bit better. So secondary succession, we're still screwing it up, but your existing communities are not completely destroyed. Um, so it's easier to pick back up your environment from a secondary succession versus a primary, because primary, you're starting with a blank slate. Um, this is faster again. If we're talking about on land, your soil still has some organic material. This would happen after a wildfire, hurricanes, floods, over farming, lodging, whale falls, synthetic coral reefs. Succession at hydrothermal vents. This could have been one of your answers on your quiz today. Um, so this is one of the first species that are going to inhabit a hydrothermal vent area. What, so like right when, right when the mantle of the earth is coming out of the, um, coming out of the ocean, the bottom of the ocean, right? We have this underwater volcano happening. It's going to solidify and start to build your hydrothermal vents. But right when that happens, we have nothing living there. And the first organisms, we call them pioneer species, that are going to inhabit there is the, this tube worm called Tevnia. Tevnia is your first tube worm species to inhabit it. Okay. After Tevnia kind of sets up shop there, Tevnia gets taken over by a better, stronger, you know, better looking tube worm called Riftia. And it's faster growing. Riftias can be up to two meters long. This adult tube worm's been taken from its white tube. Gross. It's just gross. All right. Know this. You need to know succession at a hydrothermal vent goes from Tevnia to Riftia. You're like, what? What are those words? I know. Literally, I know. I taught myself this last year. Tevnia and Riftia. I did not study hydrothermal vents in college. So, you know, write it multiple times. Say it multiple times. You have to know it. Tevnia, and then it goes to Riftia. T and then R. Tevnia is little, so they're usually white, um, and it's stained brown here from iron, from the vent fluids, from every, like, because there's a lot of minerals coming out. Riftia is this longer tube worm, has that white chitin shell. Okay, again, Riftia. You don't need to know its body plan. A whale fall. Please watch both of these. They're awesome. They are awesome. So a whale fall is also a secondary succession. This is when the whale carcass sinks and a new ecosystem starts to grow on it. It's awesome. It's called a whale fall. This is another thing you could have written for your extra credit on your quiz today. Um, anybody who's maybe was absent on Friday and is taking the quiz on Monday you do not get the opportunity for extra credit on the quiz. You have to be in attendance to have it. Okay, check out these videos, they're awesome. We're almost done. So extreme and um, instability in environments. So if we're looking, um, okay, extreme and unstable environments. So talking about um, their biodiversity, they tend to have low biodiversity. An extreme environment is gonna be like um, the Arctic, like a, a glacier environment. Um, it's gonna be definitely your hydrothermal vent environment. That's extreme. You have really acidic conditions. So you have low pH, remember that's, that's acidic. Um, the pressure is unbelievably high. You have, it's very dark. Um, it's very cold, but right here at your vents, the water is boiling. It is in, it, yeah, and it's it's toxic. 
So that is going to have really low biodiversity. It is an extreme environment. It is a low biodiversity because not many organisms are adapted to living there. You need to have very specific adaptations to live there. Now, if we look over here um, at a sandy beach environment, this is also going to have low biodiversity. No, it's not extreme. It is not extreme, right? There's not extreme temperatures and it's the water boils and lightning strikes. It's, it's not extreme. The pressure isn't too high. The temperature isn't horrible, but it is unstable because you have the tide coming in and out. Um, you know, it ha it's really susceptible to weather patterns and weathering. You can have organisms drying out easily. So for that, you have to have certain adaptations to live there. It is not a stable environment. It's not extreme. This one, not extreme, but it's not stable. Doesn't stay the same. Hydrothermal vent, it is stable. It does not change that often. Nothing's changing it. The tides going in and out is not changing it. The sun rising and setting is not changing it. It's stable, but it is very extreme. The conditions are extreme and they have low biodiversity. Now, if you have a stable and favorable environment, you're gonna have very high biodiversity. So the temperature you know, stays a relative constant or maybe only fluctuates within 20 degrees. Um, the pressure isn't too high, so you're not too far in the depths. The salinity isn't too high. The pH isn't crazy. Um, you're not exposed to sunlight and in, in almost drying out. It's stable. Coral reefs, their environment stays stable all the time almost. And it's favorable. It is not extreme. So you're gonna have high biodiversity there. A lot of organisms can live there and tolerate it. <sighs> Two more slides. Okay, a specialized niche. Areas that have high biodiversity. High bio diversity are going to have very, uh, well, we're going to say they're specialized niches. Why? All right. Think about, think about a coral reef. There are so many species, different species that live there. They can't all be doing the same thing, eating the same thing, living in the same place, or there's going to be problems. So, we say they have a specialized role. Um, we also say they follow very narrow food requirements. There are so many organisms that we can't, in, in the coral reef, we can't say, okay, you guys can eat all of this. No, you can have this, you can have that, you can have this, you can have this, you can have this. You can only live right here, and you can only live right here, and you can only live right here. And so we have very narrow ranges of where they can live. Otherwise, it's gonna cause overlap. If two different species are sharing a food source, competition. Two different species are sharing a habitat, competition. So we say that um, places with high biodiversity or coral reefs are going to have very specialized niches because they can only have a narrow, you know, small area of where they can live and where, what they can eat. So specific habitats, there's just so many there. They, they have to have like a purpose and not overlap somebody else's. Butterfly fish is an example because they live in coral reefs. Any organism that lives in coral reef could be an example. Um, these guys are territorial. They live really closely with corals and anemones. Generalized niches. So um, it's general. You know, these, these are organisms that can live in a wide range of habitats. Um, Therefore, they are not stuck to just eating one type of food source all the time. No way. They are migratory. They can, you know, like sharks, they can live in multiple different kinds of salinities, temperatures, pHs, where like our corals, it's got to have a stable pH, got to have a stable salinity, got to have a certain depth, got to have a certain temperature. But these are going to be over here, your generalized niche are going to be organisms that don't have to stay in a certain temperature, a certain pressure, a certain salinity. They can kind of move around. Um, a shark is a great example of this. So they can exploit a wide range of food source. Again, our shark. They're not stuck to just eating one thing because there's so many of them. No, they, they can live in a big area. So they can eat whatever the heck they want. And they can also exploit a wide range of habitats. Example is tuna.
or a chart. Okay, very common question. Why do habitats, it would say explain why, habitats with high biodiversity tend to contain narrow ecological niches. Each species has its own niche in the ecosystem. What would happen if the niches overlapped? You would have interspecies or interspecific competition. One species would die out or leave. Narrow niches, you stay here, you stay here, you stay here. They're giving each other their space. They reduce any kind of overlap so that it stops competition and it stops death. We did it, we did it, we did it. Good job, guys. All right, let's see, your test over this and now we will be practicing, 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 practicing. Your chapter two test is um, Thursday the 13th. So you have a couple weeks, you have a couple weeks. Best case scenario, do your notes as soon as you can, get them done so that in class, we're practicing, 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 and we're not doing practice with notes that you haven't done because then it's going to be pointless for you. So get this done. We got the vocab for this for this set of words um, due on the 30th on Thursday. Your vocab quiz is on the 31st, a week from today. And then the 13th is your first test. Boom. Have a good weekend.